You've heard of high net worth, but we're talking about high net purpose. We want to find out how entrepreneurs, global leaders in our network are allocating financial, human, and intellectual capital in pursuit of purpose. But more importantly, we want to understand the compromises, the paradoxes in their approaches, pitch decks, and philosophies. Welcome back to High Net Purpose. In this episode, we get to speak with Vicky Raynal, a leading financial psychotherapist. She has pioneered principles to help clients transform their relationship with money. Known for her award-winning book, Money on Your Mind, she takes what we know from behavioral economics into the personal realms of relationships, addiction, control, overspending, and secrecy. We cover areas of deep interest to us in generational planning around successful wealth transition, the changing significance of money as more women make and inherit wealth, fundamentally how money can be a major unconscious driver of biases in our relationships and actions, and often distort our true purpose. This is the Vicky Raynal episode. Vicky, welcome to High Net Purpose. Thank you for having me. So have you managed to have an articulation of your purpose? Well, I think I, it hasn't changed much since I was a little. Um, I had a grandma who always used to say, do something that is useful for society. And that kind of stayed with me in the back of my mind as I was growing up. And, and it became my own when I was about um, a teenager. I, I figured out that I, I wanted to do something that helps people in some way. And I started becoming more interested in psychology. And that kind of led me down the path of psychotherapy. But later in life, it kind of became it kind of solidified into something a bit more specific, which is around financial psychotherapy. So my, I would say my purpose now, at least in my career, is to help people develop what I call financial emotional awareness. So being able to use money to enable happiness, but be more conscious of uh, what guides their financial choices so that um, they can live a a happier life and so, so your your purpose as you described it there and i know you're more used to being on the other side of asking <laughs> questions um in in your great book money on your mind you do at the start talk about um some when you were younger and, and your dad writing a book about money potentially had an influence on you as well yeah so i think with any purpose or passion uh, there needs to be kind of an emotional attachment to it and and there, it was an emotional experience that fueled it so uh, you know my family had its own complex relationship with money that had a real di- deep impact on me and i benefited a lot talking about it in my own personal therapy i learned about you know what did money represent uh, why was it so painful uh, as, as a topic? Why did it impact everybody so much? And, um, and in a way, that process really, really helped me, uh, helped me grow and helped me feel more in control of my own choices when it came to money. And then there was kind of a more of an intellectual interest in it because sandwiched between my psychology degrees, I have an MBA. And I found that even though kind of in the MBA, they do cover the topic of uh, behavioral economics, behavioral finance. And so psychology comes into it, but more maybe of in terms of how as humans, as a group, we tend to make some, uh, we have cognitive biases that skew our thinking around money. I was surprised when in the psychotherapy training, it wasn't really focused on very much. And I thought, well, why is that? You know, as psychotherapists, we have all the tools that we need to think about how people behave with anything, really. Why isn't it being applied to money? And so I started researching and, and, and writing more on the topic. And, and that also kind of fueled the interest in it. So you covered a bit of it there earlier on, but being a money psychotherapist, is that a new vertical or is this, is this a area that you've cultivated? And, and, and what does it look like? I think it, it depends how you look at it. You know, in a way, I'm not doing anything other than using all the tools that psychotherapists have been taught and applying them to money. And, and that maybe it's kind of doing it in such an explicit way is new, but any psychotherapist can do what I do. And if you think about it, you know, we, uh, 
a psychotherapist, we might see somebody who overeats and we ask them, you know, why do you think that is? And sometimes there's kind of a, an emotional void that they're trying to fill through food. And with m many people, it can be money can be the object that they choose to act out that same emotional need with. So instead of overeating, they might become very greedy financially and start hoarding a massive wealth, not just um, because they want more money at a rational level, but also because they're trying to address kind of an, an internal hunger an emotional hunger. And that's what I try to help them explore and understand when it when it becomes out of control, because, of course, as a psychotherapist, people might come to me when at a point where they've started to struggle with money, when they don't feel in control of what they're doing anymore. So what are we talking, so um, I guess the one question could be, what does a healthy relationship look like with money? But the, the contrary being, what does an unhealthy relationship look like? What, what sort of behaviors, et cetera, are, are we talking about? All sorts. And uh, I think people tend to come to me when they have tried going, let's say, to a financial advisor, a plan or a coach. They know what they should be doing with money, but something gets in the way. And that something tends to be something emotional. Something is unconsciously getting attached to money. Money has started to represent something that needs to be understood so that they can feel more in control of their choice. They can say, okay, for example, you know, I'm, I'm investing all this money in this venture that is clearly failing. Why am I doing this? Well, maybe it's because there's a part of me that really needs to prove myself to my family. I really need this to succeed because I never felt I was taken seriously. And so until we uncover that and we unpick it, it is very difficult to kind of step in and do what they feel is best. And so you some and sometimes with these things, you you have to go back in time quite a bit and in, you know, the, the case I was just talking about, I reference in the book, and it actually it was a person who was the youngest of a string of siblings. And so they never felt really taken seriously in the family. And they also never felt capable, you know, everybody else, all the other siblings could reach the top of the counter, could, you know, multiply and uh, easily, and they were always the last one to learn everything. And so when they uh, set up a venture with other people, uh, they always felt they had something to prove because they, they really didn't feel they had enough to bring to the table. And so you can see how emotional experiences that date back to childhood could actually impact how we bring ourselves in the workplace, how we negotiate a business deal, how much money we pump into a venture, you know, how, how we deal with the kind of share negotiations. So all these things can be emotional. So uh, at one end, you've got, you know, addictive behaviors of overspending, et cetera, all the way to are people clearly and unemotionally uh, uh, in their business and in their money interactions making the right decisions? Is that whole spectrum that you're looking at? Yes. So I, I have uh, people who deal with overspending, with underspending. So what I call financial anorexia in the book, kind of a difficulty enjoying the money we have. Um, there's a lot of people who keep financial secrets in, in families and relationships. And so understanding what the secret represents, what the fear of disclosure is about, uh, is important. Um, there's issues around greed. You know, I, I see a lot of people who um, are very successful and despite the success, uh, they feel very unhappy. And so they carry a lot of guilt about their unhappiness and it's very difficult to kind of reach out for help because there's this stigma attached to having money and being unhappy. You know, isn't money supposed to make us happy? And so kind of unpacking what, what were they hoping success and money was going to bring them and it opens up a whole range of more kind of existential questions that are, is really what, what is leading um, the, the anxiety or the unhappiness. Um, and you talk um, in the book as well about symbolism and what the money represents. Yeah. Is that a, is that a recurring thing in, in, in the in sessions you do? Yeah. So, you know, it, when we talk about money, when, one of the things I help my clients think about is what does it mean to you? What does it represent? And it's kind of, think about it as pulling a thread. You know, they, they come, they bring the financial 
difficulty or behavior that they're trying to change and they feel stuck with. And, and once you start asking, well, you know, what is that about? What, why does it come up with that particular person, you know, be it your spouse or a colleague? Why, or how are you feeling right before you overspend? And a, a lot of these questions actually bring us to a point in which we begin to understand that the issue at hand wasn't really about the money, but it was about fairness or equality or power control or even love and or a desire to be looked after you know sometimes i've seen this a lot in relationships you know somebody being quite resistant to get involved with the finances in the relationship and maybe even kind of self-sabotaging financially quite a bit needing a rescue from a partner why does that happen well sometimes it's because maybe there's a need in us to feel looked after by another person and so them looking after the finances, making all the decisions, rescuing us financially help, helps us feel looked after, eases that part of us that uh, maybe is afraid of, uh, of feeling neglected and so on. Personalities are probably set when we're quite young, mm -hmm. but is there the potential that having a lot of money can alter our personality as we get older? Mm. I wouldn't say that it would alter your personality, but I think you might find that people do unusual things or out of character things with the money. Um, and I always invite them to explore why that is. So take, for example, somebody who never was particularly generous. They might become very generous when uh, they have a lot of money, which is a great thing. But I think it, it invites a question, you know, what place within you is that coming from? Is it coming and I've seen the full range, right? So is it coming from a place of wanting to share? Uh, how much you have, you know, is it an altruistic act that makes you feel good, makes the other person feel good? Or has it tipped over? Has it become so extreme that it has become a masochistic act? So actually, instead of um, giving it from a place of feeling abundant and wanting to share, you're giving it because you feel that that's the price you need to pay to be loved you know in in relationships you need to give more than you receive and so you're acting out that part of your personality that maybe was invisible before through money and uh, you know it found a way to express itself and and some people for example might feel so guilty about having money because maybe they became suddenly rich and their family is st uh, still lives in scarcity or was living in scarcity growing up, that they actually start giving it away, almost trying to get rid of it to address the guilt. So you see how, you know, the same behavior could have a, a positive kind of psychological motive driving it or a negative one. And I think understanding it helps us feel more in control about how much we end up giving or not. Understood, because you see the opposite too, right? Where it's potentially that you become less generous and mm -hmm. someone with nothing would give you the shirt off their back and you get that so again, there's, and I think in the book, we see this regularly that you, you talk about that there's never a direct line that people may have a very, they may have had the same experience earlier in life or something, but they have a different outcome. Yes. And, and, and that there are cases, of course, and it invites the question, you know, what, what is driving that? You know, is it a, a fear of exploitation in some cases? You know, is it this part of us that fears that People are only interested in our products and not really in us. And so we, we become more withholding as a result. Or I've seen it in a wealth transfer when a, and it's quite painful and difficult to get to it. But sometimes parents can be very envious of their children because maybe they worked very hard to get to build the wealth they have uh, yeah. in the here and now. And, and there's a part of them that envies the fact that their children have it so easily. And so they become withholding and maybe understanding those feelings uh, is the best way to make a choice about, well, do I want to be acting out this envy by being so withholding? Or can I accept that despite them having it easy, you know, I can, I can help them uh, build an experience in which they still have values uh, around working hard and, uh, you know, finding purpose in life and so on. I'd love to come back to the next generation um, wealth transfer transition topic. But um, in the book, you talk about the US study 
um, where lottery winners are more likely to declare bankruptcy within three to five years than the average mm. American. Um, why, why is that? Is it down to financial literacy or is it other aspects? Well, financial literacy can be part of the mix, um, but there's other factors. You know, one of them is the fact that they enter an ecosystem that puts a lot of pressure on them to spend more. They get approached by family and friends who've become aware of their financial status. And, and there's that pressure combined with uh, maybe a sense of guilt of having more than everybody else uh, had, has, uh, as I spoke about before. Um, but there's also uh, something called mental accounting that, that comes into it. You know, the, the money that is uh, acquired maybe through a lottery or a sudden kind of come upon suddenly isn't considered or in our minds in the same way as the money we earned, for example. And so we spend it more carelessly because... We, it has less value, even even if it seems irrational in our mind, we attribute less value to it. It was kind of it was acquired easily, so it can be spent more easily as well. Um, conspicuous spending. Um, uh, what sort of drivers do you see behind that? Uh, again, in in the book, you 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 talk in one section about Greek kids um, uh, spraying champagne all over the place at a, at a party being reported in, in the media. Um, uh, drivers of that type of activity, is it, is it similar to what you've already described or is there a, a whole other area of, you know, subconscious drivers of this behavior? Well, it, sometimes it is an expression of a narcissistic personality. So it's one way in which uh, we become uh, um, exhibitionistic. It's one way in which we uh, want to attract attention, we want to attract envy. And often that kind of personality is, is a result of um, insecurities, vulnerabilities that we're trying to cover up and compensate for. And so we build this outer persona um, that really doesn't match our own self-perception. And so we take um, we make financial choices out of that part of us that needs to be reassured that other people will be um, will see value in us when we don't. So, what what, what does it look like to to help um, manage some of these behaviors? What, what what would a process look like? Well, um, usually when people come in the room for the first time, I ask them what brings you here. And then uh, we go from there and it, it it's literally, as I said before, pulling a thread, you know, I don't uh, come with a set of uh, pre-prepared questions or uh, we don't go straight into the child and childhood experiences and things like that. But it's kind of exploring around the topic that will lead us into the deeper issues. Um, people tend to stay anywhere between a few sessions to 10 years in therapy. But as I said, sometimes the, the money issue is only present in the first few sessions. And other times it, it's a, a thread that runs right through the therapy because you see, if it's a per, an expression of a pervasive aspect of your personality. So if you're somebody who tends to be controlling with everything and with money, then you will see that come through in many different areas of your life. And those will come up in therapy inevitably. And in the same way, money will come up as we talk about your issues of control. Um, and you, uh, a number of your clients are, are, are women. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is there any um, pattern or change to um, what you see on, on the, on within gender bias and um between men and women that you, you deal with? Mm. Is, it, is it a different set of issues? Not always, but there are some issues that are particular to women uh, in that for many of us, we carry a blueprint of relationships that is based um, on kind of the traditional family setting in which the man uh, would go out and work and uh, bring in the money and usually manage it and make the big financial decisions and the decisions around investments and so on. And the woman would be more responsible for housework and looking after the children. And so in this day and age where you have women who sometimes earn more than the man, 
going against kind of the blueprint that we inherited can create all sorts of emotional conflicts. And sometimes these are unconscious conflicts that get kind of acted out and you see the couple kind of fighting about all sorts of trivial things. And then when it comes to it, it's about the power imbalance that has been set up by the financial imbalance. And you can see the couple beginning to have maybe even sexual difficulties because suddenly uh, the woman feels less feminine as a result of being the one who's in charge of finances and the man feels castrated as a result of not having enough. And that doesn't mean that it happens in every couple. Some couples manage to kind of success successfully negotiate this dynamic. Yeah. But um, in many cases, it can get acted out in different ways. And so, you know, I've, I've worked with women who um, have been successful and some who have come very close to success, but then kind of couldn't go all the way through, you know, somewhere they sabotage themselves because of that part of themselves that still doubts, you know, uh, am I deserving of this? Uh, can I be good with money? Can I walk in confidently in a salary negotiation and, and feel like I deserve this? Because that's a, in salary negotiation, uh, th that is one where, you know, you can get a big difference in men being way more aggressive and, and um, women just be more um, balanced and looking for fairness. Mm. Um, is that, am I, am I being, you know, uh, too broad brush in that? Or is that, is that actually a characteristic? And if, if so, why? Well, I think it's, it's that, that many women at one level believe they are deserving of it. Uh, but maybe at another level, it, it is very difficult to go against what's familiar. And I think this applies in all areas of, of life. You know, when, we've, when we're used to something, a, a dynamic um, that we've inherited and we've seen modeled, it's hard to go against it. So if the model we grew up in was that mom made less money, then maybe there is a part of us that is kind of doubting uh, that we can actually make that ask, feeling completely comfortable with it in a way in which a man might not be troubled by. So how do you help um, your clients overcome that? Well, a lot of times it's about spelling it out and uh, seeing what where the conflict is. And then we can think about, well, do you want to continue to subscribe to maybe beliefs that belong to the past? Or uh, will you dare do something differently? And when we ask that question, sometimes some of the fears come into play and we can think about those and um, that's how in time change happens. So going back to the next generation wealth transition uh, complexity, um, have you worked with parents or children who have inherited and uh, um, what have you learned? Hmm. Well, with both and I've learned that the more it is talked about wealth transfer and how it will be done and what it means, the better it is for the family. Because when things are left up to interpretation, then we interpret things often from a place of fear. And so I've seen, for example, uh, clients who came to me very puzzled by why they inherited so much less than a sibling. And when we go into, well, why do we imagine? It hooks into fears, well, maybe I was loved less, maybe, you know, they cared about my brother or my sister more, which is a very painful place to be in. And if you think about the parents, sometimes, you know, all they meant to do was maybe give more money to the sibling that they felt needed it more because they had more children or because they were dealing with whatever difficulty or disadvantage, but how it's interpreted is very different. And so kind of having uh, a clear and talked about and shared um, wealth transfer plans is important. That's that's and for sure. Have you seen any learnings as to how far that should go? Because some of the, the common questions tend to be, you know, what's the right age? Mm -hmm. um, should you disclose the values that we're talking about? Should it be, you know, made conditional or put in a particular structure, etc.? Um, um, any any learnings or insights from from your work that? help answer those questions i guess they're very individual they are very individual but i would say you know a lot of parents are worried that um 
transferring lump sums uh, would spoil the children. Um, transferring too much might spoil the children. And I think it's important to, um, well, be, be open about uh, some of those concerns so that the children don't experience the parents as, you know, withholding for no reason, but can actually um, understand the rationale behind why things are structured the way they are. And, and maybe, you know, even some honesty and, and sharing uh, from a personal experience, if they have lived, you know, losing motivation or drive at some point in their lives, they might want to tell their children that, you know, I know what it's like to lose drive and motivation, and I wouldn't want you to be in that same situation. And this is why I'm setting things up this way. You know, I've seen, for example, uh, around uh, philanthropy, a lot of uh, conflict come up. And, you know, why are my parents giving so much away to charity and they don't just, you know, save it for me and, you know, I could benefit from that money later on. And, you know, we can dismiss that as children being greedy, but actually when you start exploring it, th there can be some real um, painful issues that come up where money has begun to represent for the child what they didn't receive from the parents. So it's kind of, it's an emotional greed really uh, that is getting expressed through money. They don't really have a problem with a philanthropy per se. They're trying to claim something from their parents that they didn't receive and it's getting expressed through money. So once wow. once you kind of identify that, yeah. uh, they let go of that uh, grudge about uh, the money that is going elsewhere. But you can see how in their minds, you know, these other children getting the attention uh, or the money um, is a representative of maybe work that was taking mom and dad away on all these work trips and they weren't available for me. So it, it, money has become symbolic and it's it's not really about the money that is being given away. And then work, working with the, the, the children of wealth, any any strategies that tend to work particularly around bringing back purpose into their life that maybe is being taken away to some degree when money is no longer uh, an issue? One of the things that I've seen is that children appreciate when they become involved, uh, you know, let's say in the family business from a place of, you know, the parents wanting to show and teach and share rather than maybe too early in the process being handed something off, you know, maybe a small company to manage and, you know, without the adequate handholding mm. that helps us learn the valuable lessons um, about money and how to manage it. So I've seen uh, children from high net worth families being given too much responsibility too quickly because the parents are kind of proud of them and, you know, the degrees they got and surely they'll be able to manage. But of course, they forget that it was through their own mistakes and life experiences that they learned to to manage money. And if the children aren't given the opportunity to learn those lessons in a contained way, rather than be traumatized yeah. by being given too much responsibility too quickly, that feels overwhelming. Um, and then they develop all sorts of kind of imposter syndrome and, and kind of insecurities that are very hard to work through. And I think that's the... Because it's a tough balance building the right level of resilience mm. um, without, you know, making it traumatizing. Yes, that's right. Um, you want to gradually expose them to difficulties, not, you know, throw them in the deep end, hoping they will uh, come out of it because it can go both ways, really. And then the um, the, the control aspect as well, that there's mm. the, the potentially the um, in some situations where the, the might want to be controlled for the wrong reasons around the, the money transitioning. Have you, have you seen uh, cases of that? And mm. what, what typically tends to drive that? Well, a few things tend to drive it. One is sometimes a controlling personality uh, will find it difficult to uh, delegate and relinquish yeah. responsibilities. But sometimes, you know, when we're talking about wealth transfer at a point where the parents are retiring, it is um, they're coping or trying to cope at some level, conscious or unconscious, 
We're losing control over other things, you know, the process of aging. Uh, they might be, uh, it might unsettle their, um, their identity if they've always identified with work, letting go of that is unsettling. And so there are kind of vulnerabilities that get triggered uh, by the process that some people cope with by becoming very controlling about it. And so because everything else feels out of control, this area I will still have some control over and set my terms and uh, you know, we'll demand it's done that way. Sometimes it's a lack of trust too. So if we don't trust that our uh, the money that we worked so hard for will be handled in the way we want it to, then of course it, it is very tempting to place all sorts of terms around it. Because sometimes it's not the money that changes you, but it's the it's the the money changes the people around you. Mm. It makes them more rapacious. You mean, or more? Well, it's just that I guess it's the sort of the lifestyle inflation, all that sort of stuff that can come when someone's you know doing well, and 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 then people treat them differently. And and there's even been analysis yeah. done of how um, psychotherapists will treat a wealthy client differently versus an, mm -hmm. an, someone who isn't. Mm. Well, we're hopefully we're trained not to treat them differently. But lifestyle inflation is a big issue for, for many people. And, and I've seen it, you know, even in families that can afford to inflate their lifestyle. They do it, but they resent it and regret it and sometimes don't feel they have much of a choice over it because maybe the, the rest of the family. So I've seen fathers, for example, that, that come to me with that issue that, you know, the rest of the family puts pressure to inflate the lifestyle and they have gone along with it. And now it's come to a point in which they don't think it's right anymore. They don't, they don't feel comfortable about, you know, whatever the number of cars or the, uh, you know, yeah. the expense on the trips and, and, they feel that it's really sending the wrong message to the children, but they kind of feel stuck and, you know, they don't, they don't want to disappoint. Uh, they don't want to let the family down. It almost feels like they, uh, they don't feel they can step back from it. And, and that's a difficult place to be in, um, you know, having to have difficult conversations with a family. But the, I guess what I help them do is think about how to do that. Because, um, I guess in where you have couples where there's a difference of, of opinion on, on which way it would go and mm -hmm. you don't do couples therapy, but um, how do you, how do you advise your clients to start those conversations? Mm -hmm. Are there any rules of the road around money that make it a, 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 a better conversation? One thing I always tell them is that when there's two different money approaches, they both have pros and cons. And when we argue about money, we get very stuck on two dimensions, which is why am I right? And why are you wrong? And actually, we're missing uh, out why, you know, the, the, the vulnerabilities that the downsides of our money behavior and the good sides of theirs. And once we become more conscious of those and bring them into the conversation, that's when we develop a space for compromise. So to give you an example, you know, if I'm very frugal and my partner, you know, spends mindlessly, well, you know, I can go on for ages about why it's so good to be frugal and they could go on for ages about how they are enjoying the money rather than, you know, accumulating for never day. But, you know, it's only until I can acknowledge that actually Yes, I do struggle to spend money uh, sometimes, and I do wish that I could enjoy it in the way my partner does, that we can't really develop that space for compromise. So I'd say that's kind of the, the one tip I always give. And then, you know, being, being honest and curious is also important. So, you know, why is frugality so important to me? Trying to kind of get to the bottom of what is this about and um, can it help me understand my approach more and can, can it help my partner understand me more so i think having those com conversations openly honestly and without judgment um 
and at the right time, because sometimes people mention money, which is an anxiety provoking topic for many people at the worst possible time. You know, it might come up when, you know, the other partner is tired and about to go to sleep or walk off out the door and and then it turns into an argument in three seconds. And of course it does. If you're, you know, if you have a person in front of you who is impatient and you're trying to get empathy out of them, it won't work. So the timing is important too. Uh, I think you've spoken before about a um, financial date. I think, was mm -hmm. it talking to the FT? Is that, is that yeah. a thing? Well, you know, some couples do it. They go on, uh, or they sit they don't go out to do it they might sit uh you know at the table one time every month and talk money you know do a check-in think about you know are we doing the right thing should we change anything should we tweak anything um how do we feel about it and well they report back that it's very helpful but of course it's not easy for everyone you know avoidance is a very common strategy when it comes to money um even in uh, high net worth clients, you know, things can sit there being uh, unaddressed or unacknowledged until, you know, one of our advisors might bring our attention to it. But, we, you know, people can can face a lot of resistance when uh, around a topic they don't understand a lot about and, and vagueness uh, becomes or avoidance become very good strategies. We kind of put it off. We don't deal with it we procrastinate because we did talk about that earlier on briefly on financial literacy but mm. the, the the whole world of money is also beset with uncertainty you we we may not know how long we live or what money we might need and what will happen to inflation or mm. um our investments or um currencies so does that create another aspect to people going this is an area i can't get my head around uh, there's an agency issue with the advisors I talk to, whether they're investment advisors or tax advisors, that I just want to put it in a box and just not deal with it. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody likes uncertainty. Uh, the fear of the unknown, I think, is a pretty much a, a universal phenomenon, and and we have to deal with a lot of it when you know there's inflation, uh, threats of recession, and um, all of the things that are happening globally, and so. Those are things we have to accept are out of our control. But mm. when it comes to financial literacy, there's a lot that is within our control. And a lot of people, um, you know, resist or avoid uh, broaching the topic when actually learning a bit more about it would go a long way. And studies have shown that uh, around half of the population suffers from financial anxiety, mm. but that anxiety decreases the more we understand money, the more we know about finances. And uh, considering how low the levels of literacy are, even in uh, countries like the UK, you can see how there is kind of a low hanging fruit for a lot of people. Understanding more helps them feel more at ease and maybe even see opportunities to improve their finances where uh, they didn't know before. So we're working with advisors that will help educate and help them understand better rather than create a wall that makes it more difficult and and puts it in that box away from where they want to spend their time and interest. Yes, and I, you know, not everybody can afford an advisor, and but they can still go off and learn in different ways. But for people who can afford it, um, it, it has a lot of psychological benefits. For some people, it's about the peace of mind that you have, that somebody else is looking after an area that sometimes you're avoidant about. For other people, it's, you know, having that meeting in the diary, however many, uh, every month or six months, whatever it is. But that kind of gives them the ease, the peace of mind that, that there is a time in the calendar that is set out for thinking about finances and, and that has value as well. And, and then the, the element of trust, you know, you know that there's somebody who has more knowledge than you, who will help you navigate the unknown, the uncertainties, the doubts, and maybe even think through some of the options with you. So, so trust is important and then consistency of, 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 of talking through it. Yes. Yeah. Um, money should give us security and freedom. But quite often it seems to be a negative feedback and that's not what happens. Mm. It is um, for a number of reasons because 
not everyone can use it as an enabler for happiness. Uh, as I have been talking about today, for some people, it's never enough. And why is it never enough? Because maybe they they're hoping money will get them something that is unrealistic. You know, is it going to make them more lovable, more desirable? Um, they find out that the answer is no, it won't be money that will do that. Something needs to shift internally, either about how we feel about ourselves um, or how we think others think of us. Um, that's what's going to make the difference. It won't be money. And so a lot of um, insecurities get attached to it um, that are misplaced. Um how often do your clients do a reassessment of their values? Mm -hmm. Particularly, I guess, when it comes to the, the wealth transition or, 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 or dealing with a, with a change in their circumstances. Yes. I, I mean, another, any big milestone in life, uh, I think, tri triggers thinking about um, what, do we, what do we value. I find birthdays kind of the... A lot of people come to therapy when they're 39, 49 or 59 <laughs> and, uh, and you can see what, you know, what's coming. Uh, those are times in which people uh, ask themselves again, some, some questions, revisit some of their choices um, and you know, around um, maybe losses uh, is another big trigger for, for rethinking things. So there's a, there's a few. Um. And then finally, what advice would you give a, a young Vicky? I'd probably give myself the same advice that Warren Buffett gave me 15 years ago. I had the chance to meet him in Nebraska through London Business School. And it was a, a moment in my life in which I had to make a career choice. And, um, and I asked him, you know, how, do, how would you navigate it? And he said, you know, never follow somebody else's definition of success. Make sure you follow your own. And that's why I think purpose is so important. You know, I went back to my idea of purpose and, and success, and that, that helped me navigate that decision. But it took me a while to follow his advice, and that's why you know, I had to go back and tell myself a few more times. Um, but it is orienting to have a sense of purpose. It really helps you make uh, choices when there's too many variables that need to be taken into account and i've certainly been in that place in my life what a lovely note to finish our conversation <laughs> thank you for for your time and, and the work that you do with your clients <laughs> thank you for having me all content of high net purpose is provided as general information only it does not constitute any advice recommendation or representations and is not intended to influence listeners or users into making any specific investments or any other decisions Please be aware that guests and presenters on High Net Purpose may have investments in any of the topics or products being discussed. Their reviews and opinions are their own and should not be taken as endorsements of financial advice. For making financial decisions, we strongly recommend seeking advice from a qualified financial professional. This podcast may not be copied, reproduced, further distributed, published in whole or part.